Hi guys, welcome to part two of our timeline prophecy study. The first uh, one we did was just lit getting a, a good handle on the calendar and finding out what year it is this year in 2024 and a little bit about how it works. Now we want to look at the second timeline prophecy where the Bible sets a date for a certain event to occur, and that's 32 AD. And I have some very interesting information for you with this. So if we go forward and look at this, the text we'll be using is Daniel chapter 9. I think most of you are familiar with this. We're also going to be using a Dead Sea Scroll called 11Q13, which is also called 11Q Melchizedek. So let's look at Daniel first. This is the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks. He says in Daniel 9, 24, and this is the King James Version, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So that would probably get us all the way to the, the holy person being anointed as king, which starts the millennial reign, is the one we're wanting to do. Now he goes on and says, Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that's the key there, to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah the Prince, now, it'll be argued that this should just be an anointed one because the word ha, it's not ha Mashiach. The word the is not in the text. But there is a uh, Semitic construct in the uh, grammar when things are put together, much like we do dashes. So it would be like Messiah dash prince would be the Messiah, the prince. Uh, they would use a line above the word instead of under it. But same basic thing. There's only one way you can translate this as the Messiah or the anointed one. So from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to when the Messiah, the prince, comes shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's 62. And then the street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Some people ask why the seven, the 62, and the one? Because number one, there's seven weeks from the commandment to when the entire thing is finished. They had to stop. It was 49 years, but they had to stop because of a commandment, and it just took a while. And then they built the street, uh, the buildings, the temple area, the city, the wall around the city, and all that in, in 49 years. And then there was three score and two weeks from that point to when the Messiah comes, and then there'll be another one. Now, we could talk about the gap that's in between, which is very clearly listed here, but that's for another study. So that's what's going to happen. So let's look at when this commandment was given. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the month of Nisan, which is our March, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, and you can look this up and find out when he became king, uh, wine was set before him, and I took the wine, this is uh, Nehemiah talking, and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been before time in his presence. So he goes there, and, and he's upset, and the king asked him why, and he talks about his city being destroyed, and asked the, the king to, you know, help him rebuild it, or allow him to do that. So in verse 5, it says, and the king said, if it please, I said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that you would send me to Judah unto my city, my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. So he's asking permission to rebuild the temple, or the city rather. Um, so a letter was sent to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give timber and make beams for the gates of the palace, uh, which uh, is for the house, for the wall, for the city, and the house that I shall enter into. So they're going to construct all these things. So the places for the people to make their own houses so they can live, and then the city being taken and the wall and that kind of stuff. So we can look this up, and this, mar this date is given March 14th, 444 BC. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But if we go back from, or continue with Daniel then, so therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, 444 BC, March 14th, 
unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Okay, so we're talking about 69 weeks of years. Uh, 70 would be 490, so we're subtracting that last week. It's 493 years. That should make sense. Okay, so after the three score and two weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. So the very next day usually is the way this stuff happens to the day, all the prophecies. But the Messiah is killed after that 69 weeks, the 7 and the 62. But not for himself, but for the sins of the people. The people of a prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know that happened with Titus in 70 AD. The end will be like a flood unto the end a war of desolation is determined. So this prophecy is saying that there's a gap. And after the Messiah dies, and we know historically 40 years later, there was the destruction of the temple. Then there was some skirmishes. Then there was the Gar Bar Kokhba rebellion in 135. And then the entire country was dissolved. Okay, so for the next verse to happen, the country has to be reformed, which is 1948. They have to take back the Temple Mount, which is 1967. Then they have to build a temple, which has not happened yet. Then the rest of the prophecy can continue. So we can see here just by talking about between Messiah and the destruction of the temple, there's at least a 40-year gap. So some people try to teach there's no gap in here, but it's very, very clear. So being cut off is when the Messiah dies. So there has been some controversy on maybe not when the Messiah dies, but the week before based on the Passover and dates, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this specifically says that after the 62 weeks, he's cut off. We're talking about his death. So let's look at the calculations. And calculations for this date are given in several places, each with the same idea, same ending date. Ancient church father Julius Africanus wrote a book on the weeks of the prophecy, specifically about this prophecy. And so he relates how to calculate it basing, based on the uh, Jewish calendar, the way they do things, and the Roman calendar they had at the time. So he wrote this about 200 AD. Now, Sir Robert Anderson wrote a book called The Coming Prince in 1887. It was published. He did the same thing, only he related it to the Gregorian calendar. Slight difference. So anyway, he does this. Now, you'll probably hear um, video teachings from Chuck Misler, Grant Jeffrey, and many other people saying the same thing in several places. But they're talking about this particular date, and they all agree on this. So let's go on and look at this. So the calculations are as follows. There's 70 weeks which equals 490 years. You subtract the last week for a future tribulation period. That leaves 483 years. There's an ancient Jewish prophecy code that sets the dates using 360 days per year. Now people ask, why a code? And most of the prophecy teachers have said, don't know. We just noticed the code. We don't know how it started or anything. Well, now that we have the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, Again, we know how it started. There, In the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, there are 12 months, 30 days per month. That's 360 days inside the months of a year. And there are four days, the, what they call tekufa. It's this, the equinoxes and the solstices, the day that's not a full day of spring and summer, but in between. Those are actually outside the months. That's just the way their calendar works. So based on that, uh, a code was developed. If we're going to make sure that the Gentiles don't know what's going on, we'll use this code. So when you're talking about years, sometimes they use 360 days instead of 364. Now we have 365 and we have a leap day every four years. They have a leap week every um, five to six years. So it ends up being the same over a large amount of time. So there's the actual true tropical year, and then there's how calendars work, and each calendar works differently. So that's what, where that 360 code thing came in. So we're going to look at that in the next three uh, uh, videos. So 483 years, which is the whole time period of seven years minus a tribulation, times 360 days per year with that code is 173,880 days. 
So when we go forward with this, that equates to, if you take 173,880 days and put it on the Gregorian calendar, which is 365.25, that comes out to 476 years and 21 days. Okay, so 476 years times 365 and a quarter days per year comes out to AD 31. Now, in normal math, there's uh, negative one, there's zero, and then there's positive one, and you go forward. On calendar systems, specifically Gregorian, there is no zero year. So when you're crossing from BC to AD, you always have to add a year because it's uh, changed that way. So 31 becomes 32. Since there's no zero year, we add one year. This brings us to 32 AD. Now, adding the remaining 21 days to March 14th is, uh, brings us to April 6th, AD 32. Now, a couple points about this date. Um, number one, people ask, well, how do you know March 14th was the exact date in which um, the decree was given? There are some, or at least were, some old documents that gave us that date. It's in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, so you can get it down to the year. And it says it was in the month of Nisan. So you can go back and figure out that that's always March, uh, depending on when it starts or if it's at the very beginning or very end of March, but usually March. Uh, so but to pinpoint the 14th, there are some dates. Chuck Missler, again, Grant Jeffrey, many other people have talked about these. I have not seen these. I don't know if they still exist or not. For my purposes, I don't really care for the date exactly. Uh, just the fact that it's a prophecy. And if, if you believe in prophecy, the dates would have been perfect anyway. Much like in Exodus chapter 12, it talks about uh, when the Exodus occurred, it was fulfilling the 400-year prophecy to the day. So that's important for us to know God is punctual. So going on with this, people will say, but April 6, 32 AD was not a Passover when Messiah was killed because it was not a full moon. Well, again, the Pharisees have went, uh, currently the modern Jewish calendar is based on a Pharisee calendar, which is a lunar calendar, and it goes by a new moon and a full moon. The old calendar goes by a uh, solar calculation. So let me show you this. Um, on our next slide, uh, this is our Dead Sea Scroll calendar from dsscalendar.org. And I just pulled up, I, I went from this year backwards until I found a year that works. Everything's always going to be give or take three days more or less. It's got to be in the same week or we get a leap week. So it stays fairly accurate. But the uh, Takufas are always on a Tuesday. The first year, first day of the new year is always on a Wednesday. You can do this on a 364 day calendar. 364 is divisible by seven exactly 52 times so a full week 52 times ours is 365 so our weeks are all messed up this one is is not so it starts in march of 23 and the 14th of nisan is always passover and that's april 5th so passover starts in the evening of tuesday and goes through wednesday and then the, the 15th which is the high holy day which everybody has to be off the cross by starts on the evening of the 15th or in the evening of Wednesday here. So what we're going to see is Jesus on the 14th had a Passover with his disciples. And then on the morning of Wednesday, he was crucified and put in an airtight tomb. Well, this means on a Gregorian calendar, he's crucified on April 6th, which is that Wednesday. And it was still uh, the 14th of Nisan on Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday night. So it fits perfectly. And then he was in the grave for three days and three nights. So that is uh, Wednesday night to Thursday, Thursday night to Friday, Friday night through Saturday. So sometime after Saturday at dusk, when the sun went down, he resurrects. Now that Sunday when they come in, which would be April 10th, or would be the 19th of uh, Nisan, is when the stone was already rolled away and he'd been resurrected. So it fits perfectly with us. But I wanted to make mention of this because when Chuck Missler and Grant Jeffrey and some of these other guys were asked about the April 6th dilemma, the answer was, don't really know. It doesn't seem to fit, but the numbers are specific. The decree was the decree. 
one plus one is two. I mean, you it's you can't get around it. It comes out to April 6th. And the answer is we don't really know why, but that's the date given. Something happened if it wasn't Passover. And the answer to this, according, was actually Passover. So that's the kind of the long way of doing it. Now, 11Q Melchizedek or 1113. Uh, this is cave 11 of Qumran. That's why 11Q. And then 13 is the 13th one, or the name is Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek is a name of a, a type of priesthood. Paul references it quite, reference it, is it quite a bit in um, Hebrews. So basically, Melchizedek is the, the priest that the Messiah is. He's not a Levitical priest. He's a special priest. So Melchizedek, if they have the same theology we do, is talking about the Messiah. We're going to see that here. So it says, Moses said in the year of Jubilee, each one is to be freed to return home. That's a quote out of Leviticus. And he described how, saying, in this manner of release, let every creditor remit what has been lent to his neighbor. He shall not press his neighbor or his brother for repayment, for this is the Lord's release and has been proclaimed. That's from Deuteronomy. So what they're going to say is this is an actual law of Moses that has to be done every seven years. All debts are forgiven. It's a good way to curb or control inflation. However, it has a prophetic meaning. And it says its interpretation pretends to the end of days. Now, we usually think about the end of days as being when the tribulation comes and the Antichrist and everything's over. And we know that after that, there's a, there's a thousand year reign of Christ on earth before the destruction of the planet. So the actual end of our time, so to speak, isn't even with the Antichrist. So when you talk about the end of days or the end of time or the last days, they're talking about of an age. So there's the last days of the first 2000 year age. And that's when Abraham, Isaac and Jacob found Israel, began the preparations for the law and the Messiah. The end of the second age is uh, 75 AD, uh, which we'll see later. And that's when Messiah came, died on the cross, and you know, all this kind of stuff. So that's the end of that. The end of the third age is 2,000 years later, which should be within Antichrist and the seven-year tribulation period and those things. And then the millennial reign is actually half an age. It's three and a half years or three and a half ages, so to speak. Um, so that's what's going on. So they're talking about the end of their age. So they're looking for the Messiah to come, not the kingdom, but the Messiah's death and resurrection and salvation. So it pretends to the end of their days, around 70 AD, more or less. The captives that Moses speaks of are those to whom Isaiah says to proclaim freedom to the captives. Now, this is the quote that Jesus quoted in his first sermon in Luke chapter 4 when he went to Nazareth. He said, in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled because he was there now. And its interpretation, they say, is that the Lord will assign those freed to the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek. So if we accept the Messiah when he comes, Will, became, will become Melchizedekian priests, kings and priests, a kingdom of kings and priests, as Peter says. Um, not a priesthood of sacrificing animals, but a representative of Messiah on earth. And will be freed from our sin nature. That's pretty interesting. Even those, so you might think, well, I'm too bad for this. I can't be forgiven. Even those whose teachers had deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. So even those Pharisees and Sadducees, and if you've been lied to and you're in a cult, as soon as you understand that, you can repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness and ask for salvation. And it will be granted to you. You'll become part of the sons of heaven of the lot of Melchizedek. Or to put it in English, run it through Greek and English, a Christian, a follower of Christ. Okay, so this is interesting. Look very closely at our dates. The Lord will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek and will make them return. That's teshuva, so that could be return or repent. Make them repent and proclaim freedom to them. Their freedom comes only with repentance. I thought that's interesting. But it frees them not from their money problems, 
but it says to free them from the debt of all of their iniquities. Their sins are forgiven. That's fantastic, and you're granted eternal life. Well, when does this happen? This event will take place the first week of the Jubilee that occurs after the ninth Jubilee. So when we get to look at this, an age is 2,000 years. It's made up of four onas of 500 years apiece. An ona, a 500-year period, is made up of 10 jubilees. A jubilee is 50 years. And in each jubilee, there are seven shemitahs, or seven weeks, seven sets of seven years, which is 49 years, and then there's a jubilee year. So what this is saying is in their time period, which ends in 75 AD, it's exactly one jubilee. Otherwise, they'd say, um, let's say said it's in the ninth after the ninth jubilee, uh, one week and two years is what they would say. And if they just said one week, then it's a seven-year period even. So in this case, there's 10 jubilees that finishes out their ona, and it's in the 10th jubilee. So if it ends in 75, you back up 50 years, that's 25 AD. And then one week of years later, 25 plus 7 is 32. So this event where the Melchizedekian priest will proclaim freedom to us and take the debt of our iniquities will occur in 32 AD. Now, it doesn't give us the date, and you should know the prophecies and the, and the festivals, so you would probably guess Passover of that year, but whatever, it doesn't matter. 32 AD is the date that they're given. And this is fantastic. They may have explained this based on Daniel 9 that we just read, or maybe they got it from the Holy Spirit, but either way, they were accurate. And again, give or take a year, because calendars are that way. I'm just showing you, though, if you had the right date and did it right, you could come out to the exact year and even the exact day if you get your calendars straight. So now let's, let's continue here just a little bit. Now, the Day of Atonement is at the end of the 10th Jubilee. That'd be 75 AD for their age. When the atonement is made for all the sons of heaven, atonement means everything is finally finished. By that time period, you've had the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. There's the stopping and the shutdown of the Essene temple in, in uh, Egypt in 73 AD. And then the uh, Council of Yavne agreeing to stop everything, temple sacrifices, in 75, which is the exact end of the age. Now, Bar Kokhba came along and tried to revive it many years later, but it fizzled out. So that, that happens a lot. But the end of the age is 75, and that's when atonement is made. The evil Sadducees and Pharisees, and if you go back and read Eusebius and Josephus and those other historians, they were really, really bad. The apostasy had hit really full force. Okay, so it says at the end of the 10th Jubilee, which is AD 75, the atonement will be made for all the sons of heaven, for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. This will be the time of Melchizedek's day of grace. So the age of grace will officially start. Or the, 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 and the, they're called different names. The first age was called the age of creation. The second age was called the age of Torah. The third age was called the age of grace. And then the kingdom age is that last, only, only lasting 1,000 years, that last piece. So in this case, this is when the age of grace begins, according to them. So very, very interesting. Now it goes on and says, this day of peace, it's also called the day of peace, is about which God spoke through Isaiah the prophet when he said, how beautiful are the mountains, uh, are the feet of the messenger who proclaims peace, the messenger of good who proclaims salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. Now, this is a quote out of uh, just, just verse 7 of Isaiah 52, but they explain what this means to them in their theology. So you've got beautiful mountains and the feet of a messenger who proclaims peace. I've got to figure out who this messenger is. And God reigning on Mount Zion and salvation coming. So they say its interpretation, that verse, to them means this. The mountains are the prophet's predictions about the messenger. The messenger is the one 
anointed or the Messiah, of whom the, by the Spirit, of whom Daniel said, until the Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks. So in the prophecy of Daniel, talking about the Messiah coming, that's the messenger that Isaiah is talking about in verse uh, 7 of chapter 52. So how beautiful are the prophet's predictions about even the feet of the Messiah who proclaims peace, the messenger of good who proclaims real salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. Now this gets really interesting. Uh, the next part of this says, he is the messenger, the Messiah, whom Daniel said, the Messiah, the anointed prince. He is the messenger of good who proclaims salvation. He is the one to whom it is written when it says, to comfort those who mourn. That's Isaiah 61 again, where Jesus said it was fulfilled in your hearing. To instruct them in all the periods of the ages in truth. That's fantastic. One of the things Messiah did, that apparently is not recorded in the Gospels, is to instruct us or remind us of the true calendar. All the periods, onas and jubilees, of the ages, the true calendar. Very important for us to know, otherwise we guess at prophecies. Zion is those who uphold the covenant, those who love and wait for Messiah, those who turn aside from walking in the ways of the people, the sinners. But now look at this, your God, where it says your God reigns, the Messiah is saying your God reigns, your God that he's referring to is Melchizedek, the Melchizedekian prince or priest. So basically this is saying that they believe the Messiah is God incarnate. Very, very important theology. Uh, just the same theology that Christians have today is what, what the ancient Essenes had, according to their own words. And he saves them from the hand of Belial, is another word for uh, Satan. Now, if we went on with this particular document, it's fascinating because it begins to talk about a time of the, the establishment of the kingdom and the rapture and things like that. And it begins to set, it looks like it's going to try to set dates just like this, but that's where the text at. And we've got the beginning and the ending ripped off. We've just got the middle piece. But thank the Lord that we have this. So to conclude, 11Q Melchizedek says the age ends at 75 AD. A jubilee is 50 years. So the ninth jubilee ended on March of 25. So March of 25 plus a seven-year period, one Shemitah, one seven years of, of weeks, one week of years, comes to March of AD 32. March in that, where, where we saw was uh, March and April. So uh, that time period, the beginning part. So their text shows us that it happens in March or in April, we're real close to that, the beginning of the year in uh, AD 32. So fantastic. So Daniel tells us AD 32 down to the date. According to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, that was the exact day that Messiah died. And according to 11Q Melchizedek, it's supposed to be that year sometime. So we've got all this corroboration. 32 AD is the coming of, of Messiah's first coming. So we'll end this here, and with the next study, we'll look at the next timeline prophecy and see it's done the exact same way on the calendar system, and we'll see 1948 as an important time that a certain event occurs. Thank you.